Good morning. morning. Opportunity missed. When Pastor Mark asked me if I would share this morning, I of course said yes, otherwise I wouldn't be here, right? Um, He gave me a a, a wide open, clean slate. He said, Kevin, you could share whatever you'd like to share. Had I had been thinking clearly, perhaps I would have chosen the narrative of the children of Israel in the desert wandering around for 40 years or so. That would have been smart, but I missed the opportunity. However, not that far off in the the biblical narrative uh, of the children of Israel, I want to look at Exodus chapter 33 this morning. Exodus chapter 33, before they come to the place of wandering in the wilderness or in the desert. The Old Testament is so rich. So much we can learn from the lives of those who have gone before as we can see God working throughout redemptive history. And it's, you know, it's really important as we begin here just to remember that there's nothing haphazard in the scripture. It's all, God has a purpose in in every word, every page, every paragraph. And so as we look at Exodus chapter 33 this morning, this might be a passage you're not terribly familiar with, but I want to encourage you to lean in, asking God to share with you, to show you something through his Holy Spirit this morning. Exodus chapter 33, verses 1 through 17. It's a longer passage. I would encourage you, if you have a Bible, to pull it out and follow along. Maybe get your phone out if you prefer to use that. But um, try to stay engaged as we read this passage. And then what I want to do this morning is share three or four things I believe we can draw from the passage and apply to our lives to help us as we journey together on this journey of faith. Exodus 33, beginning in verse 1 through 17. The Lord said to Moses, Depart, go up from here, you and the people whom you have brought up out of the land of Egypt, to the land which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, To your offspring I will give it. I will send an angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go up among you, lest I consume you on the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. When the people heard this disastrous word, they mourned, and no one put on his ornaments. For the Lord had said to Moses, Say to the people of Israel, You are a stiff-necked people. If for a single moment I should go up among you, I would consume you. So now take off your ornaments, that I may know what to do with you. Therefore the people of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments from Mount Horeb onward. Now Moses used to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp, far off from the camp, and he called it the tent of meeting. And everyone who sought the Lord would go out into the tent of meeting, or out to the tent of meeting, excuse me, which was outside the camp. Whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people would rise up and each would stand at his tent door and watch Moses until he had gone into the tent. When Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent, and the Lord would speak with Moses. And when all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, all the people would rise up and worship each at his tent door. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. When Moses turned again into the camp, his assistant Joshua the son of Nun, a young man, would not depart from the tent. Verse 12, Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now, therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me your ways that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. And he said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And Moses said to him, if your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people's? It is, not in your, is it not in your going with us so that we are distinct, I and your people, from every other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, this very thing that you have spoken, I will do, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Let me give you a little bit of background uh, to kind of catch you up to speed to what's going on here. If, if you're not uh, familiar with this passage, I want you to understand what's going on and how we come to this place. The background is this. In the book of Exodus, God calls Moses to lead the children of Israel out of slavery in Egypt. You may recall that in Genesis, uh, God shows the people favor through Joseph. 
and Joseph is raised to the high level, the second in command of all, in all of Egypt. And so the Israelites enjoy that. And then later on, a Pharaoh comes to power who did not know Joseph. And the, the Egyptians begin to get concerned about the large number of Israelites that they might one day revolt and, uh, from, from, uh, and take over. So the Pharaoh enslaves them. And they find themselves in slavery, but God has a plan for them as he had promised many, many years ago. And so he calls Moses to lead the children out of slavery in Egypt. And Moses confronts Pharaoh and says, hey, let my people go. Pharaoh has a hard heart. Uh, God hardens his heart, in fact. And so God sends plagues and Pharaoh eventually relents. And the people then on their way out come to Mount Sinai where God enters into covenant with them. Let me give you a little bit of a, a flavor of that. I'll, I'll read chapter 19, verses 8 and 9. So you can see the relationship that God is having with the people. It becomes important for a background. Uh, chapter 19, verse 9. And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am coming to you in thick cloud. I'm sorry, that's verse, I read the wrong part. Verse 8, 19, 8. All the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses reported the words to the people to the Lord. And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I'm coming to you in a thick cloud that the people may hear when I speak with you and may also believe you forever. So God enters into covenant and the people say we're going to do what God has told us to do. A similar scene happens in chapter 24, verse 3. And the covenant is sealed in a very dramatic way. The people have agreed to do what God has commanded them. And then in chapters 25 through 31, while Moses is on the mountain, God gives him very specific instruction for the building of the tabernacle. And this is really important background for where we're going to go to this morning. The tabernacle is the place and the means by which God chooses to dwell with his people. Keep that in your mind. The place and the means by which God chooses to dwell with his people. So... In chapter 29, let me read to you verses 45 and 46. God says, I will dwell among the people of Israel and will be their God. And they shall know that I am the Lord their God who brought them out of the land of Egypt, that I might dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. It is God's pleasure. It is God's purpose. It is God's plan to dwell amongst the people in the tabernacle. That's what he's giving to Moses on the mountain while the people are down at the base of the mountain. And as God gives this instruction in verses, chapters 25 through 31, he gives very specific detail about the building materials and about what's to go inside the tabernacle. Items of great significance such as the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat, the golden lampstand, the table for the bread of presence, the altar, uh, the priesthood, so much more detail so that the tabernacle then is going to be the place and the means by which God chooses to dwell with his people. Moses, the Bible tells us, is on the mountain for 40 days. Receiving this word from God. And God is carrying out his plan to rescue his people and to move them and to relate to them. In a redemptive manner. And then... In about chapter 32, we see that the people become frightened. They become concerned. Where's Moses? He's been up on the mountain too long. We don't even know if he's going to come back or not. What are we to do? Verse chapter 32, verse 1. When the people saw Moses was delayed to come down from the mountain, they gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, Up, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Perhaps you're familiar with that story where they create this golden calf to worship, to treat it as its God, and even to say that this is, this is who or what has brought us out of the land of Egypt. They're replacing, they're substituting the presence of God through his servant Moses with their own golden image. And that takes us to chapter 33, where God is passing down his judgment on them. So here's what I want to show you this morning from this passage, four things that I think will help us. The first one that I want you to understand is the absurdity and the seriousness of sin. The, abs the absurdity and the seriousness of sin. The Lord said to Moses, chapter 33, verse 1, depart, go up from here, you and the people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt to the land of which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying to your offspring, I will give it. Verse 2, God says, I will send an angel before you, and I will drive out these peoples. An angel before you. Notice what he doesn't say. 
but he'll go with them. He says, I will send an angel before them. No longer will God go with them on the way to the promised land. Now get this picture in your mind. Remember, Moses had been up on the mountain for 40 days, and God is giving him all this detailed instruction for the tabernacle, which is to be the place and the means by which God will dwell with the people. At the bottom of the mountain, the people are rebelling. And what seems to be driving this is their fear and their anxiety. What's going to happen to us now? We don't even know where Moses is. Is he, is he alive? Is he going to come back? What are we going to do? We need to create an image to worship. God had provided Moses. God was in the, literally the process of providing for them instructions to build the tabernacle. And they're turning aside to that. God desired to be in their presence in the midst of them. So here's the absurdity of sin. What the people wanted most, close proximity to God and assurance of his presence, they sacrificed when they tried to obtain it outside of his timely provision. Did you catch that? God is providing over here for his presence to dwell among them through the tabernacle. At the same time, they don't want to wait for that. They're concerned, they're afraid, they're anxious. They're going to do their own thing. They're going to short circuit the will of God or the, pur the purpose of God or the plan of God because they can no longer trust that God's going to do what he had told them that he was going to do. Aren't we good at that in our own lives? Aren't we so good at short circuiting God's plan and our blessing for lives because we want to seek after that thing that we think that we want or that, th that thing that we think that we need? that desire that we have, and so we, we go about fulfilling it in our own way when God has said all along, I'll provide every need that you have. I will be for you all that you need. Rather than trusting God to provide for our needs, we step outside of his will and his provision to try to get what we need or what we want on our own terms. I should clarify that and say what we think we need, what we think we want, we seek that on our own terms rather than trusting God to provide it for us. So often it happens like this. A temptation is laid before us, whatever that temptation might look like for you. In the back of our minds, we think, well, if I don't pick that up, if I don't engage in that, if I don't follow that path, I'm going to miss out on something. But the reality is we should be asking ourselves this question. If I do pick up that temptation, what am I going to miss out on? What is it that God wants to give me? What is it that God wants to provide for me? that I'm going to miss out on if I pick up this temptation. The people were interested in the presence of God and his, the proximity of God in their lives, but they weren't willing to wait for him to provide it. That's the absurdity of sin. And whether what we feel is emotional or what we feel is physical, whatever it is that we think that we want or what we need, if we go after it on our own terms, we're missing out on what God would provide for us. And I assure you this, what God provides for us is always better and more long-lasting and more real than any temporary payoff we might get with sin. That's the absurdity of sin. And the people of Israel, it's so plain and clear. God is providing for this at the same moment they're rebelling against it taking this into their own hands. Not only do we see that sin is absurd, we see that sin is serious. We see this in several ways. First of all, we see it in God's gracious statement that he will not go up with the people lest he consume them. Chapter 33, verse 3. Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go up among you lest I consume you on the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. Sin separates us from a holy God. God will not be in the presence of sin. And so he tells them, listen, I'll send an angel before you. I'm not going to go up with you, with you, because you're a stiff-necked people. Your sin is serious. It has separated us from a holy God. We also see the seriousness of sin in Moses' reply to the people and in his intercession to God on their behalf. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit more about intercession in a few minutes, but let me point this out to you in chapter 32, verse 30. As, as Moses is talking to the people and to God, chapter 32, verse 30, the next day Moses said to the people, you have sinned a great sin, and now I will go up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. So Moses returned to the Lord and said, alas, this people has sinned a great sin. They have made for themselves gods of gold. 
Moses doesn't try to diminish the sin. He doesn't, he doesn't go to the people and say, hey, you know what, it's not that big of a deal, it's okay. He doesn't go to God and say, God, just, turn, just don't, don't worry about it, let this roll off your back. It's not, a, it's not a problem. No, no, Moses calls it out. You have sinned a great sin. He says that to the people, and then he acknowledges it. He confesses it before God, that these people have sinned greatly. He also recognizes their need to be forgiven, that this sin is a problem. The sin is great. It's significant. It's substantive, and they need to be forgiven of it. And so Moses says, again, in chapter 32, verse 32, but now... If you will forgive their sin, but if not, please blot me out of the book that you have written. Moses recognizes that this sin is so serious, it's got to be forgiven. It's got to be dealt with. It can't just be ignored. And he recognizes their need of the people for someone to stand in their place. So he intercedes for them. We also see the seriousness of sin in the people's response to God's judgment of their sin. Chapter 33, verse 4. When the people heard this disastrous word, they mourned, and no one put on his ornaments. When the people heard this disastrous word, unfortunately, it all... It often takes a consequence to our sin for us to realize the seriousness of that sin. we got to be- see it to believe it. And sometimes our sin goes on for a while and there do not appear to be immediate consequences. But as a pastor said many, many years ago, one of my first pastors when I was probably 15 or 16, he preached a sermon one Sunday called, When the Chickens Come Home to Roost. I still remember that because eventually the chickens come home to roost. And we face consequences of our sin. And sometimes it's only through God's gracious allowing of us to experience consequences of sin do we realize the seriousness of sin. We have to see it to believe it, but we really just need to read it to believe it. God says sin is serious. And it will be dealt with. The people are devastated by this judgment. It's disastrous for them. Remember, they wanted the presence of God. But they see now that their actions have really worked to provide the opposite. It will not get them what they want or what they desire. It will get them something different. Not closeness to God, but distance from God. We also see the seriousness of sin in verses 7 through 11. Because here we see a picture of life after God's judgment. A picture of life after God's judgment. Now Moses used to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp, far off from the camp. And he called it the tent of meeting. And everyone who sought the Lord would go out to the tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. God wanted to put the tabernacle within the camp uh, to dwell among the people. But here we see that the, the, the tent is being pitched outside. So the people could still worship, but they'd worship God from afar. How sad, how tragic is that picture compared to what God wanted to offer them, what God wanted to do in their midst. And so we see then a picture of the seriousness of sin in what life would have been like after that judgment. The Lord wanted to dwell in their midst, but now they would worship him from afar. When we minimize sin, we do so to our own detriment, whatever that sin is. And it's probably fair to say that in the room like this, there's probably three or four hundred different sins that we deal with. The sin, the temptation that I deal with may not be the same ones that you deal with. But when we minimize it, when we say before the Lord or in our own heart or in our own mind, this is not a big deal, I can kind of take care of this, I can put it over here, no one will ever know about it. God says sin is serious. It's absurd because you're short-circuiting his good pleasure and his will for your life and his provision of all things good, it's also serious. Let us not be people who wink at sin or who who minimize sin, who say, hey, that's not a big deal. No, no, sin is very serious. When we minimize sin, we also minimize the gospel. If sin isn't serious, the doctrine of hell makes no sense. If sin isn't serious, the doctrine of the atonement of Jesus Christ makes no sense. Why would he come to die on a cross and stand in my place and bear my shame and my pain and my reproach if my sin isn't serious? The truth is it is, and we need to act like it is serious. And what that means is we confess it when it happens. 
that we don't hide it from the Lord. Rather, we run to the Lord. Say, Father, I've sinned. And I know this is not what you desire for me. Forgive me. When we understand that sin separates man from a holy God, then we begin to see its seriousness. And we see pretty clearly in this passage in Exodus 33 that sin is absurd. It makes no logical sense because we're short-circuiting God's plan and his good will for our life and his provision for our life, but it's also very, very serious. The second thing I want to point out to you about this passage this morning is God's provision of an intercessor, or God's provision of intercession. God provides for the people an intercessor in Moses. Chapter 33, verses 12 and 13. Moses said to the Lord, See, You say to me, bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Now, God has said, I'll send an angel before you. But he's saying, God, who's going to go with me? You have said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now, therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me your ways that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. God, these, these are your people. And so we see in the passage that we're looking at this morning that God is providing an intercessor. We might see it more clearly back in chapter 32, verses 30 through 34, which I actually read earlier. But I'll point you back to those. Chapter 32, pick up in verse 30. Actually, let's pick up in verse 32. But now, if you will forgive their sin, but if not, please blot me out of your book that you have written. The Lord said to Moses, whoever has sinned against me, I'll blot out of my book. But now go, lead the people to the place about which I have spoken to you. Behold, my angel shall go before you. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. Moses is aware of their need to be forgiven. So he says, I'm going to make atonement for them. He actually offers himself up as a sacrifice for the people. Did you catch that? God declines that offer. God says no. But Moses says Blot my name out of the book. If, if you'll forgive them, great. But if not, blot my name out of your book that you have written. What I want you to understand this morning is in Moses' intercession, he's as much concerned about the glory of God as he is concerned with the good of the people. He's got both things in mind. Moses is as much concerned about the glory of God as he was concerned with the good of the people. As far as the glory of God goes, we see in chapter 32, verses 11 and 12, he's concerned with the reputation of God. Moses implored the Lord his God and said, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say, with evil intent did he bring them out, to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your burning anger and relent from this disaster against your people. Moses is concerned with God's reputation, with God's glory. He's concerned that pagan nations will make accusations about God, that they would accuse God of not being trustworthy or even worse, of being cruel. I don't know how much you and I think about this. How much do we think about the glory or the reputation of our God among the nations or among our neighbors? But Moses was concerned about it. Now, this does not mean that we simply do what others want us to do or that we give in to the current cultural moment. Far from that. But if we say that God is good and then we treat others poorly, what are we saying to the world about God? What does that say about the reputation, the glory of God? If we say that God is truth but we lie, what does that say to the world about God? If we say that God has sent his son to redeem humanity, but we do little to share that news, what does that say to the world about God? If we say that God is a God of second or third or fourth chances, but we refuse to forgive others when we're wronged, what does that say to the world about God? Listen, we need to be concerned about these things. Moses was concerned about the glory of the God, about his reputation among the nations. Jesus says it this way in Matthew 5, 16. Let your light shine before men so that they will see your good deeds and give glory to your Father in heaven. The opposite of that would be, hey, don't act in such a way that people see how you act 
and then they don't believe what God says or who God is because of your actions. No, no, let them see your good deeds so they'll give glory to your Father in heaven. What we need to be asking ourselves is this. What message are my attitudes and my actions sending to the world around me? Just from the past week, think about conversations you've had. Think about interactions that you've had with people. Did they point people toward God or away from God? Did your actions speak the truth about who God is? Or did it leave someone wondering about God's goodness or his kindness because you didn't display goodness or kindness to them? Does my faith appear to others to be alive? And then, importantly, what about my willingness to spread his glory around the world through evangelism and missions? How willing am I to take that good news to the nations and to the corner of my neighborhood? Moses, God provided an intercessor in Moses. And as Moses talks to God, we see he's concerned both for the good of the people and the glory of God. It's a great lesson there. For leadership, for parenting, for marriage. One of my favorite definitions of leadership is simply that. Taking initiative for the good of the people and the glory of God. Taking initiative for the glory of God and for the good of people. That's what we see in Moses as an intercessor. So we see here the absurdity and the seriousness of sin. We see the provision of intercession. We also see the priority of God's presence. Back to chapter 33. Verse 14, God said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Verse 15, Moses says, if your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. If your presence won't go, God, don't send us. There's nothing for us if you're not with us. Nothing is worth doing if we don't have the presence of God in our lives. Here's what Moses knew. Moses knew that it was better to be in a tragic place with the presence of God than to be in a happy place without it. Isn't it true that we seek happiness? We want to be happy. And I'm not talking about joy, which is rooted in the work of the Spirit in our life, an overall understanding that God is working to, to accomplish His will and His work in our life. And even when difficulty comes, we can have a state of joy. No, happiness are those temporary things that we reach for. And again, in a room this size with this many people, there could be 300 different things that come to mind when I say, what makes you happy? But we, we strive for happiness. But to get happiness outside the presence, presence of God is not a helpful thing. It's better to be in a tragic place with the presence of God than to be in a happy place without the presence of God. I suspect that few people knew of the importance and the priority of God's presence than Moses did. You might recall uh, early on in, in Exodus where God first calls Moses to be the one to rescue his people or to lead his people out of Egypt. Moses has four or five objections to this. He goes back and forth with God. And his first objection is this. God, who am I? Why are you sending me? Like, I'm nobody. Who am I? I'm not adequate to be the one to go do this. And God's response is what? He says, you don't have to be adequate. He says, I'll go with you. I'll go with you. The presence of God was a priority in Moses' life. Now, I'd love to tell you that that was, once that objection was cleared up by God, Moses was all on board. He wasn't. There were four or five others. And it ultimately comes down to the fifth one where he says, hey, just send somebody else. I don't want to go. It's a different sermon for a different day. But for now, understand that Moses understood the priority of God's presence. When he, rec- when he said to God, who am I? I'm not adequate. God's response was simply, I'll go with you. That will make you adequate, Moses. Or better said, you're right, Moses, you're not adequate, but I am. And I'll be there. So Moses pleads with God, if your presence will not go with me, don't bring us up from here. And then he, he shares, he lists several, a few things that, that the presence of God signals. One, the presence of God signals the favor of God. How will anybody know, God, that we're favored If you're not with us, God's presence also singled that they were a distinct people. How will people know that we belong to you, God, if you're not with us? 
Oh, he understood the priority of God's presence. Now, in the New Testament, we understand that as believers in Jesus Christ, we have the Holy Spirit. The presence of God is in us. It's with us. Jesus said, I'll always be with you. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. How important it is for you and I to remind ourselves of the presence of God in our lives each and every day, each and every moment. The presence of God gives us comfort. When life gets hard, and life gets hard, doesn't it? And sometimes it gets hard briefly, and sometimes it gets hard over a long period of time. Being reminded of the presence of God in our lives gives us comfort. The presence of God also gives us certainty that we too are a distinct people, called to be of God, called to be with God, called to be His people in the world, His ambassadors. The presence of God gives us courage to live and to move forward and to share the gospel. In the Great Commission, when Jesus says, and lo, I am with you to the ends of the earth. Being reminded of the the presence of God in our life gives us a sense of purpose and of hope and of community with other believers. As I am in the presence of God and you are in the presence of God, we can't help but to be in the presence of God together. And we see a community of faith then forming that exists in the presence of God. Moses did not want to go forward without the presence of God. But with the presence of God, he understood he'd go anywhere. No matter how difficult or how tragic or complicated that might become. And that needs to be our mantra as well. Wherever he leads, I'll go. Wherever he leads, I'll go. I'll follow my Christ who loves me so. Wherever he leads, I'll go. Ryan Lister has uh, shared several things to to help clarify, to help us understand more about the presence of God. I want to share a few of those here because I do think that they're helpful in the context of this chapter. One, I want want you to understand something about the presence of God is that on one hand, we believe in the omnipresence of God. One of God's eternal attributes is he's everywhere at all times. And so, The psalmist in 139 can write, no, wherever I go here, you're there. Whether I go here, you're there. I cannot escape the presence of God. That's true. But there's a difference between saying God is everywhere and saying God is here. We can talk about God's presence being inescapable and that he's everywhere present. But the biblical story seems to turn on God being manifest presence. He is manifest present in Eden. He's manifest present in the tabernacle or the temple and in the incarnation of Christ and in the new heaven and the new earth. Yes, as an attribute of God, he's everywhere at all times. But he's also present actively in our daily lives. The presence of God finds its greatest expression in Emmanuel, God with us. When he sent his son, fully God, who became fully man and walked the earth, that he might live a perfect, sinless life, die on the cross in my place, in your place, then be raised from the dead and ultimately ascended back into heaven. We find there the greatest expression of the presence of God in Emmanuel. And then one of the things that Ryan Lister says that's so helpful for us, I think, is to be a joyful Christian is to know God's presence in your life. To be a joyful Christian is to know God's presence. Here's what he writes. He says, if we're honest, many of us can think of God as our magic genie. We keep him on the shelf until troubles arise and there's something our neighbor, something, or, or there's something our neighbor has that we really want. The problem is relationships don't work that way, especially with the trying God. The Lord overall will not be left on the shelf of anyone's life. Instead, the scripture is clear that all of life, and principally the gospel, is about being in God's relational presence being aware of what God is doing in your life today not that it's in just some general generic sense God is present but God is at work active in my life and I'm walking through life with him in a relationship that's what it means to think about and to experience the presence of God in our life and so David can com- proclaim in Psalm 1611 in your presence there's fullness of joy at your right hand are pleasures evermore The priority of the presence of God is real in Moses' mind and in his life. And he says to God, if you're not going to go with us, don't send us. There's no reason to do that. Our whole purpose for going 
is because, God, you told us you would go with us. Fourthly and finally, in this passage, we see the goodness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's a foreshadowing all the way back in the book of Exodus. A foreshadowing picture of the gospel. God had planned good things. He was in the process of telling Moses how he would build his tabernacle, how Moses was to build the tabernacle with very specific instructions so that God could meet with and dwell amongst the people. He had planned good things. But man rebelled. The people were, while God was doing this, the people were rebelling against that. Trying to do, get what they felt that they wanted or they felt they needed their own way, apart from God's will and God's provision. They sinned. God provided an intercessor in Moses to intercede on behalf of the people. And then God restored the people. In verse 17, the Lord said to Moses, this very thing you have spoken I will do, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Now that was temporary. If you read on the story, and even as I referenced earlier, as they wander in the desert for 40 years, these people don't actually get to the promised land. Because the rebellion actually continues. But it's a wonderful picture of the gospel in that God creates good. Man rebels. God provides an intercessor in Jesus Christ. That we might be reconciled to the Father. That our sins might be forgiven. That we might know him and his presence. Both here on earth and in eternity in heaven. And while their restoration was temporary, the restoration that comes in Jesus Christ is permanent. That's good news. So as you think about this passage today, I hope you leave with a few thoughts. The absurdity and the seriousness of sin. The power of an intercessor. intercessor. In Exodus 33, it's Moses. For you and I, it's Jesus Christ. The priority of the presence of God. And then also, of course, the goodness of the gospel of God through his son, Jesus Christ. I don't know where you are this morning with your faith. And I don't know where, at, at, at what point in this story you find yourself relating to either Moses or to the people or to the plight. But if you have not expressed faith in Christ Jesus, if you do not know him as your Savior, recognizing that we are sinners and our sin separates us from a holy God, and the only way to be restored to a holy God in right relationship is through the life of death, resurrection of Jesus Christ. That'll be an invitation offered to you this morning. So in a short while, we're going to sing a song, and that'll be an opportunity for you to come forward and speak with one of the pastors at the front. We'll be very happy to talk to you about that, help you to understand that. Or maybe you would say, hey, I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. I, I've, I'm a follower, but I've not been taking sin real serious. And there are areas of my life I just need to confess. And I recognize that it's affecting the, the, the sweet presence of God in my life. Yes, God's omnipresent. Yes, he's there. But my walk with him is affected by this sin. And maybe you want to come pray with someone. We'll give you an opportunity to do that as well. Or maybe you're here this morning and you believe that God wants you to join to this church and membership. Whatever it is, we want you to have an opportunity to respond to the goodness of the gospel and to the teaching of his word. Let's pray, and as we pray, you think about those things, and then we'll sing and have an honor of invitation. Father, it's so good to be in your presence. Lord, help us to, to long for that. Like Moses, God, help us to not desire anything that would take us ahead of or behind your presence, but to be with you, to experience life in its fullness, walking with Christ. God, I pray that in this time of invitation that you give clarity and understanding to your word. Father, that your spirit would move and that we would be a people who respond in whatever way you're working. And we'll pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.